Good morning. Well, today we come to celebrate or remember the death of our Lord Jesus Christ as he died there at Calvary. And the verse I particularly want to concentrate on this morning is from Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14. But may it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Or as the authorised version put it, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, before we consider that together, let's pray. Father, as we look at these words together this morning, we pray that uh, you will use this time so that we may realise again just the wonder and the amazing grace of our God in sending Jesus into the world, that he might pay the penalty for our sin, that he the just should suffer for the unjust to bring us to God. So Lord, help us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to read first of all from uh, Galatians chapter 1, the beginning of this letter, that Paul writes to this uh, province with its various churches there. And so he says, Paul, an apostle, not sent from men nor through the agency of man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren who are with me, to the churches of Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, so that he might rescue us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory for evermore. Amen. I'm amazed that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by his grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is preaching to you a gospel contrary to what you received, he is to be accursed. For am I now seeking the favour of men or of God, or am I striving to please men? If I was still trying to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. For I would have known, you brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it. But I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. So we're considering this matter about glorying in the cross of Christ. Of course it's all part, and it's the conclusion really, of Paul's argument here in this letter. And you may remember the situation that he's writing to in Galatia. It really stems back to what we read in Acts chapter 15, uh, where there were those who were saying to the Gentiles that if they were going to be saved, they needed to be circumcised and they needed to keep the law of Moses. And Paul is quite indignant about this. In fact, in this letter to the Galatians, which takes up the same matter, he's saying to them, If you began by faith, why are you now turning back to the law? If it was faith that changed you, if you received the Holy Spirit by faith, why are you now going back to the law? And of course, that was a very good argument. But actually, he gets it even, gets it, uh, makes it more strongly uh, when it comes to chapter 5. And there he says uh, in verse 3, Galatians 5, verse 3. I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole whole law. You have been severed from Christ, you who are seeking to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit by faith are waiting for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. It's a very strong words to say that if they're actually now trying to be justified by the law, to be declared righteous and seen as righteous in God's sight, that they can somehow earn their salvation, 
he says that actually you've been severed from Christ uh, and you've fallen from grace. So those are very strong words. But this is the problem with the churches in Galatia. Somebody has been giving them another gospel, saying that they need to add to faith, as it were, and strive by circumcision and by the law to be saved. Of course, we know full well that when we are saved, then we do seek to keep the moral law of God. But that's a different matter. We do not earn salvation in that way. It's just that our lives are changed so that we become obedient people, righteous people now, living as God would want us to. So one of the things, uh, as Paul is concluding here, is say, he says that God forbid that I should glory in anything save the cross of Jesus Christ. Or as is put in the New American Standard Version, but may never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the whole focus of the Apostle Paul is upon the Lord Jesus Christ and it's that that he's honouring, it's that that he's glorifying, it's that he would boast about concerning his own life. Of course, Paul had much to, to, to boast about, really. Uh, there again in Galatians 1 and verse 13, uh, he says uh, just about his own background as to how he was uh, Acting previously, he says, therefore, in verse 13, For you have heard of my former manner of life in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and try to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more extremely zealous for my ancestral traditions. So that's how it was with Paul. He could boast of his past, and did in many ways, although he counted it as nothing when it came to it. He sat at the feet of Gamaliel, probably the leading religious instructor of the day. Uh, well, I might almost say the University uh, of, uh, 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 of Israel. But there it is. Uh, this was his background. And of course we know full well that in Philippians... He does refer to his background, to his pedigree, if you like, uh, as being a Jew. He says, for a start, circumcised the eighth day. So his initiation was absolutely spot on. Of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, the very tribe that, uh, where the first king Saul came from. Incidentally, you may remember that later the tribe was almost wiped out and Israel has to find ways of making sure that it wasn't. And uh, certainly the Christian church would be for, uh, poorer if uh, the tribe of Benjamin had ceased. And he goes on uh, to say that he was a Hebrew of Hebrews and as to the law, a Pharisee, a pious one. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. That's pretty strong stuff. But then he goes on to say, all of this is but garbage. It's, it's so much greater to know Christ and the righteousness that comes not by keeping the law, but that righteousness which is by faith. And so he's stressing very much just his own conversion, really, and how he found uh, uh, that uh, justification in God's sight. And of course, he goes on to talk about the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. So he knew that it was his experience of Jesus that would give him that assurance of eternal life and not trying to strive to keep the law. He wanted to know uh, Jesus as he had indeed come to know him, the power of his resurrection, that changed life, the fellowship of his sufferings. He was entering into suffering for the sake of the gospel and Christ's sake and had indeed died to self, being conformed, as it were, to the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he is making it very clear that the things he could have boasted about, he was not going to boast about because it was just but gar garbage in his own sight. 
mind in Paul's letter to the second letter to the Corinthians, he does seem to do a little bit of boasting in many ways. For instance, in chapter 10 of 2 Corinthians 10, and right at the end, he's talking about uh, uh, the measure of his labors and the sphere that God had opened up to him. And uh, he said he wouldn't boast in what others have accomplished. And then he goes on to say, but he who boasts is to boast in the Lord. For it is not he who commends himself that is approved, but he whom the Lord commends. As I've already said, Paul is doing a little bit of boasting in these chapters, partly because there are false prophets, false uh, apostles around, who really seem to be fleecing the flock, uh, as Paul would indicate. And he makes very clear that they're actually agents of Satan. And uh, they may have disguised, uh, disguised themselves as apostles, but even Satan can disguise himself uh, as uh, an angel of light, as it's put. But he goes on to say that he, he was boasting according to the flesh. They boasted and I'll boast as well. He goes on to say this is really insane, but I'm doing it just to show that in actual fact, I'm more genuine than these who claim to be apostles and are false. Again, talks about, are they Hebrews? This is in chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians. So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I speak as insane. I'm more so. In far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I've spent in the deep. I've been on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my fellow countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I've been in labour and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. And so he continues, he even talks about uh, boasting about the revelations that he's had. But then he really comes down to it to say, in effect, yes, I may show that I'm truly an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. But he says, I would rather boast of my weaknesses than these things. You may remember that he... Uh, says there, when God makes it very clear to him, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I would rather boast about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. So while he's showing this whole catalogue of things that he could boast about, he says, in the end, what I'm really going to boast about is my own frailty, my own human weakness, because it was simply the grace of God that helped me to stand. Nothing of myself. And Paul is absolutely right in that. We as Christians, we need that grace of God to see us through. And it's only by his grace, the grace that saved us in the first place, the grace that has kept us, the grace that helps us in trials. So really, Paul is saying his true boasting is in what God has done in his life, that all-sufficient grace. Then we might just come back again to, or one other thing perhaps I can mention, is that the Corinthian church in the first letter Paul takes up the fact that they have been boasting about uh, their gifts that they had, the gifts of the Spirit. And it was a bit out of control, it would seem. But Paul says to them, you know, if you received it as a gift, why do you boast? I just think about the whole matter of Paul's ministry. Again and again, he gives credit to God and to the work of Jesus in his life. He really wants to glorify God. And that cross that brought about these things and brought about that victory. And yet, you know, I think sometimes we who are in the ministry, we like to boast of the things we've done. We like to sort of advance our, our ministry. 
perhaps by stating all the good things that have been accomplished. That's fair enough in some ways if we're wanting to give the glory to God. But sometimes we seem to be taking the glory to ourselves. God forbid that we should do that. It's the Lord that needs to be glorified. But let's come to this matter uh, of the cross once again. And the glory uh, that we should, uh, well, the boasting that we should uh, do concerning the cross of Jesus. Okay, let's take the Corinthian letter, the first letter this time. And you may remember in chapter 1, Paul is saying about uh, we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Yes, certainly to the Jews being crucified, uh, Jesus being crucified, seemed to be weakness. They expected Messiah to come all-powerful, all-conquering. And of course, one day he will, when his kingdom is finally established on earth. But for that kingdom to come, of course, sin had to be dealt with. And so Christ crucified was absolutely essential. And then Paul goes on to point out, you know, I suppose really what he's tackling here is that Corinth was the breeding ground for philosophy. And uh, its wisdom, is, that love of wisdom, as uh, philosophy means, that they would seem to be focusing on. And uh, Paul has already said, uh, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. And the Apostle Paul then goes on to say uh, that God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and the, God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, and the base things of the world, and so on. Uh, those things that are not, that he might nullify the things that are so that no man may boast before God. It doesn't matter how many strings of degrees we have to after our names, that wasn't what saved us. It isn't our intellectual brilliance, it isn't our money, it isn't all the good works that we've done, it's not all the charities that we've established. None of that can save us. It's simply Christ crucified. And of course he goes on to say, that not only that no man may boast before God, but by God's doing, you who are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. As so we've already seen, this isn't the first time that, uh, or the only place where Paul has uh, written such words. Let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. And it's particularly because of the cross of Christ. And of course he goes on to say in the next chapter, For I am determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Because that's the centrality of the gospel. That's the thing that made the Apostle Paul the apostle that he was, the man of God that he was, the champion of the Gentiles to bring them to salvation. It was all the grace of God, the wisdom of God, that Jesus has become to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. That we are declared righteous because God had the wisdom to make it possible for all men to be saved. We don't need degrees to save us. We don't need money. We don't need those acts of charity. It's by faith that we're declared righteous. It's by sanctification that we, the Holy Spirit works in our lives and it's through Jesus. It's redemption that has set us free. So it's simply in Jesus that we need to boast and it is in the cross of Christ that we need to glory. Of course, much the same thing may be found in Colossians as well, as we consider just what uh, Paul is saying there regarding... <laughs> well, it, it's interesting that quite early on he talks about uh, uh, not uh, focusing on the things of the world. 
uh, let me just turn up Colossians. He says uh, in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8, See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy, through the love of wisdom, an empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. And he goes on to make uh, it very clear that uh, we were once dead in our sins, but we've been raised up by the power of God. Uh, and he's forgiven us all our transgressions. It's there in verse 13. Having cancelled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he's taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. The picture here is that at crucifixion, uh, somebody had their crime uh, pinned on the, on the cross. You remember that what was on the cross of Christ was uh, that he is the king of the Jews. And uh, just even the debate that Pilate had as to whether that should stand or not. Or whether it should say he claimed to be king of the Jews. Interesting that Pilate wouldn't have it changed. And uh, what it's really saying here that is, if you like, you look at the cross and it's not the crime of Jesus because there was no crime. It's not the sins of Jesus because he was sinless. It was your sins and mine that uh, are indicted on the cross of Calvary. And through that, he is suffering and dying. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Therefore, we need to rejoice that he took the punishment that we deserve and that through that punishment we have found peace, as Isaiah makes it very clear. But then it goes on to talk about when he had disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him or through it. Uh, most uh, Greek scholars feel that probably it's through it uh, meaning again the cross because that uh, certificate of debt was nailed to the cross. But of course, it's not the cross per se that is important. It's the cross of Jesus. But it was his death, the, the execution, the death that he died is for our sin. But he overcame the powers of darkness. He disarmed them. Because of sin... Satan has a claim upon our lives. We join the rebels, as it were. And he can demand, as it were, our death and separation from God. But Jesus, by dying and paying the penalty for our sin, meant that that no longer applies. He cannot bring, Satan cannot bring his accusation against us. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Thank God. And we can stand absolutely righteous in his sight. So the very accusation that Satan would bring against us is thwarted completely because our sin has been wiped out. We stand pure in the court of God's justice. Not because we are pure of, of ourselves, but because we've been cleansed through the death of Jesus. No wonder Paul wanted a glory simply in the cross. And he found it so offensive that there were these Jews who were trying to encourage Gentiles and perhaps even the Jews themselves not to look to Christ and to the death of Christ at Calvary as the means of their salvation. But again, the need to try to earn their salvation through circumcision and through keeping the law of Moses. That was offensive to Paul. It was undoing all that Christ had done. It was nullifying the work of Calvary when Christ died for us. So Paul is very clear. He will only glory in the cross of Christ. So let's go back uh, to Galatians again and to that uh, conclusion really because it is the conclusion of all that he's been saying. He's not going to rejoice in the law and how he strove to keep the law or his background, his pedigree that is of the tribe of Benjamin that is sat at Gamaliel's feet. He's not going to boast about any of that. It's all worthless. And frankly, folks, all our efforts to try to earn our salvation are totally worthless. And yet people try. 
And even in part of the Christian church, really, they're seeking to do that. Uh, sadly, the Catholics talk about uh, that um, it's the sacraments that save us. So we have to go to Mass. We have to practice indulgences and penance and so on and good works to save us. That's why the, the Reformers objected. It was not true. They saw that the just shall live by faith, that we're justified by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and in him alone. So Paul there is uh, saying in verse 14, But may it never be that I would boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. He talks there about uh, the world has been crucified to me. Quite interesting, the Greek tense there for that word crucified. It's the perfect tense. And the perfect tense means that it was a one-off act which has continuing consequences. In other words, he died to the world, and in fact the world died to him. It has no claim on him any longer. He died to that once and for all in the past as we all do when we come to faith in Christ. That's what repentance is about. It's ending going our own way, finishing with the world's system and all its, its values. We're now going God's way. We died to all of that. We died to self to live to Christ, but it has continuing consequences. Thank God. Our lives are changed. He uses exactly the same tense back in Galatians chapter 2 when he says in verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. No, I think Paul must have always marveled the fact that God's love was was revealed to him so clearly on that Damascus road. He didn't deserve it. It was the grace of God. But he's saying, I'm crucified with Christ. It was, and again, it's the perfect tense. It was a one-off. It was an act there when I died to self uh, uh, and died to the world to live for Jesus. But the life I'm now living is not by my own effort. It's actually by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And isn't that the marvel of the cross? Isn't that why we should glory in it? Isn't that why we should focus on it? It's not a bit of wood that we're looking at and focusing upon. It's the fact that there on a cruel cross, Jesus suffered for our sakes. And when we surrendered to him, when we gave our lives to him, when we died to self, then we began that new life by the power of God, by the work of the Holy Spirit being born again. And it's that new life. And as Paul is concluding this letter, he goes on to say, back in chapter 6 and verse 15, For neither is it circum is circumcision anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. That's all that matters. It doesn't matter whether you're a Jew and you were uh, circumcised, or you're a Gentile and you weren't circumcised. That's not the point. It's are you a new creation in Christ? Have old things passed away? Has everything become new? Have you been born again of the Spirit? That's all that matters. The rest, the whole Jewish pedigree thing, is garbage and should be ditched that indeed they might know Christ. And he goes on to say, And those who will walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. The authorised version has got there, even upon the Israel of God. And some have taken that to mean that the church is the new Israel and that God has finished with Israel. Well, I'm not going to go down that line particularly, but to make it very clear that in Romans 11, Paul has made it abundantly clear that one day all Israel will be saved. God is not finished with them. And really what I believe this is saying is that those Gentiles who walk by that new creation and those who claim to be Jews, the Israel of God, if you like, the true Israel of God, 
equally walk by that new creation, by dying to self, being crucified with Christ. That's all that matters. Let me just finish by saying that in verse 14, it says, May it never be that I would boast or I would glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The authorised version's got God forbid. That's not really a literal translation. Uh, there's just two words that are used there. One is the negative and the other is the verb to exist or to be. And so may it never be is a very good translation, a literal tr translation. Paul is saying, may it never happen that I should boast in anything else. And my friends, you and I, whether we've been used uh, mightily of God or not, or whether we're, 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 we're people that God has used in just quiet ways, never on the platform and so on, we are not to boast in the things that we have done or what we are. The only thing we should really glorify in is the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. The cross of the one who is the Lord of our lives, Jesus who is Saviour, the one who is Messiah that God sent. That's the focal point. That's all that we can boast about because we ourselves as sinners come short of the glory of God. We've, we've totally failed. And even when we seek to serve God, and perhaps God has used us, it's only by his grace, it's only by his, his enabling, it's only by his power we should stop boasting of ourselves. May it never be that we boast in anything else. My friends, today, as we remember the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's so transforming that our focus should always be on that again and again because of what he has done. Let me just close with an old hymn that we used to sing. In the cross of Christ I glory, towering all the wrecks of time, all the light of sacred story gathers round its head sublime. When the woes of life o'ertake me, hopes to seize and fears annoy, never shall the cross forsake me. Lo, it glows with peace and joy. When the sun of bliss is beaming light and love upon my way, from the cross the radiant streaming adds more luster to the day. Bane and blessing, pain and pleasure, by the cross are sanctified. Peace is there that knows no measure, joys that through all time abide. So he concludes with the opening verse again. In the cross of Christ I glory, towering all the wrecks of time, all the light of sacred story gathers round its head sublime. This one day in history, that redeeming act of atonement, that day of atonement, and the Lord Jesus who died for us upon that cross, that sacrifice for our sin, is what we really need to glorify in and not boast of our own ability. May the Lord help us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that the Apostle Paul really did try to live that out. And Lord, we thank you that he challenged that, uh, that false gospel that was undermining your grace and your mercy. Thank you, Lord, that we simply come by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he accomplished for us at Calvary. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for each one of us. Thank you for those that you've redeemed who have become a new, crea new creation. Lord, we bless you for that. Help us to live in a way that truly glorifies you. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.